Good morning or afternoon, uh, wherever you all happen to be today, um, welcome. We're pleased to have you join us for the Sharing Ocean Acidification Resources for Communicators and Educators webinar series. The source webinar is presented by NOAA National Marine Sanctuaries and the Ocean Acidification Program. Our goal is to provide ocean acidification communication tools to formal and informal educators and stakeholders across the country to promote a more integrated and effective ocean acidification community. Excuse me, I'm working on advancing my slides here. <laughs> there we go. Uh, so your hosts for today, uh, I'm Laura Francis, Education Coordinator with the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary, and I'll be moderating today's session along with Jen Mintz, Education and Outreach Coordinator with the NOAA Ocean Acidification Program. Uh, we're really pleased that we have over 250 registrants for today's webinar from all around the world. And during the presentation, all participants will be in listen-only mode, and you're welcome to type questions related to technical issues or questions for our presenter into the question box, uh, which is uh, at the bottom of your, uh, in your screen there, you should be able to see your question box. And uh, let's see, we'll be monitoring the incoming questions and we'll respond to them or pose them to our speaker at the end of the presentation. Also, we always welcome your input on who you would like to see as a future source webinar speaker and what topics or resources you would like us to cover in upcoming webinars. If you have some ideas for us, please type them into the question box and we'll take those into consideration as we plan for the future. We're recording the session and we'll share it, the recording with registered participants uh, through Google Drive and through NOAA Ocean Acidification Program's YouTube channel. Our presenter today is Erin Winslow. Uh, the title of today's presentation is Consistent Ocean Acidification Messaging, the Key to Consistent Understanding. Erin, uh, uh, who's presenting today, she's a San Diego native who spent her childhood in and around the ocean. She received her bachelor's in aquatic biology in 2013 at UCSB after graduating, worked as an intern and then a lab technician for the Morea Coral Reef Long-Term Ecological Research Lab at UCSB and in Morea, French Polynesia. Her time in Morea exposed her to coral reefs for the very first time and she soon saw how unique and fragile these ecosystems are. Erin noticed that much research in Morea resulted in very little conservation or management um, outcomes. And to address this, Erin came to the Bren School at UCSB for her master's degree to gain a better understanding of how science, policy, economics, and interdisciplinary collaboration come together to make conservation a priority. For her master's, Erin focused on planning and incentivizing native oyster restoration in Southern California. The project gained a lot of local attention and motivated more collaborative Olympia oyster restoration efforts along the West Coast. Erin is now in her fourth year uh, of her PhD at Bren and in the hopes of motivating more conservation in coral reef ecosystems in the South Pacific through field experiments, surveying, ecological modeling, and communication. Uh, and Jen Mintz have been lucky enough to be working with Erin over the past year on developing ocean acidification toolkits for scientists and communicators. And so before I hand it off to Erin, um, let's get a sense of who is on the line today. So um, if you see the poll on your screen there, um, please answer the question, do you consider yourself an educator, communicator, scientist, researcher, or other? Um, and if, if you're answering other, please type your response into the question box. All right, we'll give it another five seconds or so. And we can go ahead and share those results. Let's see. 
see. All right, so it looks like we've got about half of the folks are educators, communicators, a third scientists and researchers, and then um, some of the others, we've got students, uh, lots of students, which is great, um, research coordinator for Sea Grant. Um, so we've got a, a nice diversity of uh, audience members here. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Aaron and you can get started with your presentation. Ooh. Let's see. Actually, uh, Jen, can you go ahead and change? There we go. Aaron, if you um, can go ahead and unmute yourself and we've um, and share your screen, that would be great. Thank okay. you. I have. Let's see. Can you see my screen? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Um, I didn't get the prompt to share my screen. Oh, wait, hold on. Sorry. There we go. Cool. All right. Can everybody see my screen now? Yep. We got it. Yeah. Just can head into slideshow <laughs> mode. <laughs> I'm only talking to you. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, I'm excited to share some things that I have been doing over the last, I guess, almost two years now. Um, and that is having conversations about ocean acidification using consistency and language as effective tools. And I'm really happy to see that we have kind of a broad um, mix of people here today in the audience. Okay. Um, quickly, the outline of the covered topics I'm going to go over today. Um, I'm going to do a brief overview of ocean acidification for folks who may not be as familiar as of what ocean acidification is and what causes it. I'm going to talk about some tools that I found to be really helpful for having conversations and communicating about ocean acidification. And then at the end, I'm going to walk through um, some examples of infogra infographics that I have created for five different regions. Um, around the U.S. for ocean acidification and regionally specific issues they all have. Uh, really quick about me, uh, Laura gave a nice bio of kind of my education. Um, to reiterate, maybe for people who just got on the call, I grew up in San Diego, California. I came to Santa Barbara for my undergrad degree in aquatic biology. Um, I never really left after that. I did my master's at UCSB as well through the Bren School of Environmental Science and Management uh, and received my Master's of Environmental Science and Management there in 2017. Um, I chose to come to Bren because a few reasons, but something that was appealing to me was that it is a program focused on bringing together people of different disciplines uh, to collaborate and work on solving environmental problems. Um, kind of the philosophy being that just ecology by itself or just economics by itself or policy or whatever the case may be, um, doesn't do as much good or make as much change as a lot of different minds coming together. And now I am still, you guessed it, at UCSB uh, doing my PhD. Um, I'm an ecologist by training and, and I'm an ecologist at heart and I'm working in French Polynesia, um, doing a lot of work with coral bleaching and mostly I'm interested in understanding how different types of disturbances and biotic factors vary and how they drive trajectories of future coral populations uh, in the South Pacific. So now we will get into why um, you all are here today and that's talking about ocean acidification because it really can be a challenge, but it can be a fun challenge if you have the correct tools and language in order to uh, have effective conversations about it. So I'm going to ask the you guys all I, a couple of questions um, just to see where everybody's at. And the first one is, how do you feel about your understanding of ocean acidification? And so people can go ahead and take a moment to answer that. And again, this is just to kind of gauge where the audience is at and who's here.
looks like we have about 82% voted, so we'll give it about five more seconds. All right, thanks so much for your responses and we'll share the results. Okay, so confident and moderately confident, that is good. Um, and for those of you that aren't sure or not confident at all, hopefully after this presentation, you will feel a little bit better about it. Um, similar question, but not quite the same. Uh, how do you feel about teaching ocean acidification, especially if you are an educator or maybe you're a student that might TA something like this in the future? So if everyone could take a moment to answer this question, that would be great. All right, we've got about 90% of the people voting. So another few seconds to to place your, <laughs> enter the poll. Mm -hmm. All right, we can share that one too. Okay, great. So it seems to me just glancing, there's a lot less people that consider themselves confident in teaching it. Uh, it seems a moderate amount are moderately confident and a few more seem unsure and not very confident. So this is kind of what I suspected. Um, I certainly share that sentiment about a lot of the classes that I TA. Um, I feel like I understand it well, but teaching it is a whole different story. So thank you for answering that question. And I believe we have one more at the moment. Yes. So what about ocean acidification seems most challenging? Um, in this, I wanted to clarify one of the answers, the lack of tangibility. Um, I'm, if you think about this in comparison to temperature, feeling a change in acidification in the ocean or seeing it is harder to kind of imagine than temperature. So that kind of abstract sense of ocean acidification is what that third bullet is kind of getting at. All right, we've got responses coming in. We'll give it another five or 10 seconds. All righty, um, we can share that one too. Mm -hmm. Okay, chemistry is kind of what I suspected. Laura, do you have access to the other section? Yeah, if you go ahead and type, if you're other, if you're the 10% that's other, if you could type your response into the question box, then we can let Aaron know about that. Let's see. Um, language for the layperson, ensuring mm -hmm. a baseline understanding of pH, ocean atmosphere interactions, uh, limited solutions. Um, the term ocean acidification is misleading and long. Um, so there's a whole bunch of um, how to make the public care. So a lot of great responses there. Great. Well, hopefully some points in this presentation will address that. And also, um, I am not very surprised to see the chemistry portion being kind of the main concern. I've done, I've taught a lot of uh, or I should say, I've, well, I guess I taught, I TA'd a lot of chem labs and chemistry sections in my graduate student experience. And I find that more often than not, people come in and they automatically hate the class just because it's chemistry and they don't like that word and they think it's scary. Um, so that is not surprising to me. So hopefully through this presentation, you'll pick up some tricks or maybe learn something or hear something a different way that clicks in your mind. Um, so we're going to do a quick overview of ocean acidification for those who are not so familiar um, as others in the audience. And so ocean acidification is the process by which the ocean increases in acidity or it becomes lower in pH through a series of chemical reactions by absorbing carbon in the atmosphere. And I'm not going to talk about chemistry and the nitty gritty today. Um, I'm going to leave it pretty broad. And this is all that, this is the most chemistry we're going to do with today. And it's carbon dioxide plus water leads to increased acidity in the ocean. And so if you take away that, then you'll be able to follow along um, for the rest of the presentation. And something that I was reminded of doing this work that I, I think that people really don't realize 
is that carbon dioxide is produced naturally and we call this regular CO2. So animals such as bears, horses, dogs, tigers, elephants, me speaking to you right now, we all breathe, we breathe in oxygen and we respire CO2. And if you scale that up across all living things on earth that breathe, that is a lot of carbon dioxide that is produced. And I just wanted to remind everyone that that is a natural phenomenon that happens in our world at all times. However, the problem kind of arises um, because humans in our inventive spirit have created a lot of uh, things that produce carbon unnaturally and we call this rampant CO2. So driving your car, getting on a plane or a train or a boat or different types of production all produce carbon dioxide. And that is what we are seeing increasing exponentially through time is this rampant CO2. But the ocean absorbs all forms of carbon dioxide, which we can thank it for because too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere uh, isn't good and can be toxic to us. And the ocean absorbs about 30% of the CO2 in the atmosphere. So this is good news. However, much like too much CO2 in the atmosphere, too much CO2 in the water also can be problematic. So this is the last polling I have for you all. And this is why is increased acidity a concern? Or why do you think it is? And hopefully that will pop up here shortly. Oh, there we go. All right, we'll give it another five or 10 seconds. All right, uh, we can go ahead and close the poll. There you go. Okay, great. Yeah, so all of the above is the most correct answer, although I put this in there as kind of a trick question. All of these answers are a little bit correct. Um, those of you that did answer all of the above um, are right, but those of you that answered none of the above are also right. Um, and I put this in here to make the point that uh, some organisms may thrive under higher acidity conditions, um, and these are animals such as, or animals or algae such as seagrass and other types of algae and jellyfish. We've seen them start to flourish under these conditions, and research has shown that not all animals will do poorly in higher acidic conditions. However, there are a lot of organisms that will not do well under these uh, changing ocean conditions. Um, and some examples of these types of animals are corals, crabs, and oysters. And something that these animals have in common is they are called calcifying organisms, and they use a compound in the ocean called carbonate in order to uh, help build their external skeletons or their shells or whatever it is that they um, produce. And this can be a, a, a big problem. And I'm going to talk about um, this and through the example of coral because that's what I know the best, but essentially increased acidity in the water deprives corals of their building blocks and other calcifying organisms such as oysters, scallops, mussels, etc. So I'm going to bring us back to our chemical equation where to remind everyone that carbon dioxide plus water leads to increased acidity. And so here we have a coral, we'll say in 1980, it is big, it's healthy, and there's lots of carbon ions floating around in the water. However, if we fast forward to 2020, um, the ocean has become more acidic in many places, meaning that there are more chemical reactions to break down carbon dioxide, and that depletes the water of this carbon ion. So there are fewer in the water for corals to use to make their skeletons, so as a result, they are smaller and weaker. And this is a big problem because in many tropical marine systems, corals are kind of the foundation species and they provide food and habitat to many fish and invertebrates, which then feed many other fish and invertebrates, which then feed even bigger ones and sometimes humans. 
right? So this is going to really drastically change how the ecosystem functions and it's going to change the food web all the way up to the top. And so this is why increased acidity is going to be a problem moving forward. And so how, how do we talk about this complicated process across space and to different types of people? Uh, these are the four points that I found to be most useful um, in my work that I've done. Um, and these are largely adapted from the National Network for Ocean and Climate Change Interpretation. We call it NYOKI. Um, and this document that I have referenced many, many, many times is in the handout section of this uh, webinar. So you can download it and read it later, or you can follow along if you like. Um, I suggest reading it later because I've summarized this quite a bit. Um, but the four main points are one, identifying gaps in understanding, two, framing in language, three, providing solutions, and four, consistent repeated messaging, which is in the form of the infographics that I created that I will share at the end. So first we'll go into identifying gaps in understanding. Uh, and these gaps in understanding are places where the public perceive and understand a particular issue, in this case, ocean acidification, differently than experts do. And I'll quickly walk through four um, examples of this. Um, and the first one is regular versus rampant CO2. And this is the, um, the pitfall that I kind of mentioned at the beginning, right? So researchers through Neoki have done a lot of work to understand um, how the public thinks about ocean acidification, what they understand, um, what they don't understand, and where these gaps are. And they found that a lot of general public members think that uh, ocean acidification is produced by regular or rampant CO2. It's not kind of a synergy of both, right? So that's the first gap in understanding that they were able to identify. The second is how people impact the ocean. This one I found to be really interesting and I never even thought about this, um, but research, research shows that a lot of general public members think that our largest impact on the ocean as a species is dumping things into the ocean, physically dumping things into the ocean, um, which I had no idea that people thought that, but that's why this research is so important and social science is so important. Um, whereas arguably the biggest impact we have on the ocean is our um, footprint and produce, putting carbon into the atmosphere. The third gap in understanding is the impact of climate change. So scientists and researchers, we know that the impacts of climate change are very complex and they're intertwined and they are vast. It's not just ocean acidification, it's not just warming temperatures, it's disease patterns, famines, cyclones, hurricanes, et cetera. Whereas people that don't belong to the academic world just consider it to be kind of a short list of temperature increasing glaciers melting. So that's another gap that's important to address. And the last example I'm gonna share with you are solutions. And so many people on this uh, call, I'm sure realize that um, in order to address ocean acidification and climate change, we need pretty much immediate policy intervention. However, many members of the general public believe in doing more green activities like recycling um, and reducing their use of, uses of plastic straws. And that's great and that's important and we need to do that, however, that's that's really not going to help solve this bigger problem of carbon emissions in the grand scheme of things. And so by understanding where these gaps lie, we can help fill the gaps in our conversations or in the educational material that we produce to help kind of bridge these gaps and help everyone get on the same page. So the second one is framing in language. And a great place to start with this is getting on this, the same ground as the people you are speaking with. And that's by establishing common values. And values in this context are broad ideals that are considered to be desirable and good. And so our Nyoki researchers went out and I believe they, they surveyed like 9,000 people um, and they found that the two most common values that people responded most positively to are protection and responsible management of ecosystems. And so I'll just quickly uh, explain what each of these mean in this context. So protection emphasizes the preservation of habitats and ecosystems, not for their own sake, but for an instrumental reason that people depend on these places and resources. And responsible management focuses on our duty to preserve and protect nature, but in some very specific, tactically important ways. 
So if you're someone that wants to create an infographic or maybe a PowerPoint or a one pager or even just have a conversation with somebody about climate change, um, this is a good place to start by establishing these common values that we all believe in protection and responsible management of ecosystems for these reasons. And then you can go into your um, specific information that you want to relay. So framing and language continued. I think if you're going to take anything away from this presentation about communicating about ocean acidification or climate change, it's just switching out pronouns. So when you read our ocean versus the ocean, it, it's you feel differently about it. If someone says the ocean, that might make somebody think of this large, vast, mysterious, maybe scary, far away thing that they don't really know very much about. Versus if you include them in the conversation by saying our ocean, that kind of invokes a sense of ownership and inclusivity of this common resource or this public good that we all have that we're all responsible for protecting um, and keeping healthy. So that I think is the most simple thing that you can do to kind of change the narrative of your conversations that you have. Um, and the last bit of framing in language is using metaphors. And these are an incredible tool. And Miyoki does such a great job of um, providing some metaphors that you can use. And I've used them in infographics. And I'm going to share one of my favorite ones with you right now. And that is the osteoporosis of the sea. Ocean acidification is causing osteoporosis. Acidification is changing the chemistry of the ocean. And as a result, many types of shellfish have trouble building and maintaining their shells. This osteoporosis of the sea causes the protective shells of these animals to become thinner and more brittle, which makes it hard for them to grow and survive. So what they've done here is they've compared osteoporosis, which I would, most adults probably are at least familiar with in the sense that they know it's a disease that targets bones and it makes bones weaker, more brittle, and they're, they're just more fragile in general. And that's pretty much exactly what's happening to a lot of our calcifying organisms that live in the ocean. And something really cool is that um, a publication just came out, I believe, last month um, from folks at Woods Hole um, titled Ocean, Ocean Acidification Causing Coral Osteoporosis on Iconic Reefs. So they're using this metaphor in order to get their message across. And this is really exciting for a couple of reasons. To me, this is inviting more than just the academic world into the conversation. Um, and it's it's an example of scientists using this language in order to engage people that aren't just other research, researchers or academics, and I really applaud them for doing that. And this is published in AGU, I believe. All right, um, moving on to solutions. So you get somebody on board with the idea of ocean acidification and climate change, and they agree that there it, it can be a problem. It's important to provide tangible solutions for what people can do to help. Um, and I do want to take a moment to just take note that it's it's important to realize that not all solutions are going to be doable or attainable for everyone. Um, number one, they they vary drastically across geographic space. Um, you're not going to put solar panels up somewhere in Alaska necessarily. And also across socioeconomic um, regions, it's it's a privilege to care about the environment and it's a privilege to be able to make decisions that might cost you more money or take more time out of your day in order to um, reduce your carbon footprint, but not everyone is able to do that. And it's just important to be sensitive to that. With that being said, I'm going to talk about three um, solutions that I like to share with people that are interested. Um, and these are all community, not all, but they can be community-based solutions. Um, which are cool because they get you involved with the community and also it's a collective it's a collective effort to reduce um, emissions so the first one is eating and buying local this is probably my favorite one um, if you live in california or somewhere where there's a lot of agricultural agriculture you can join these community supported agriculture um, group CSA, get a CSA produce box. I do one here in Santa Barbara. Um, not only are you reducing transportation emissions, um, but you're supporting your neighbors by buying local. Um, also in Santa Barbara and probably other places in the US, um, we have a seafood CSA box now so we can get um, fresh fish that's caught right off our coast and while supporting our local fishers, which is really awesome. 
It's called Get Hooked. Um, also cleaner energy, so you can buy into uh, solar grids or if you're in a windier area, wind turbines. And I'm not an en expert in energy, so I don't really have specific resources in order to do this, but if you look into it in your own community, there should be a lot of different options. And then alternate transportation. Um, California, we're not very good at public transportation, although there are a lot of people that bike, which is awesome. They have um, shared bike communities um, or even bird scooters. Public transportation, if you're in an area that provides it, although given the state of the world at the moment, it might not be the best option, but um, public transportation and alternate transportation can be really good options. All right, and so number four, which is consistent and repeated messaging. So now I'm going to walk you through the infographics that I've created for five different regions around the United States. Um, you'll notice that they have the same or very similar general messaging and words regarding ocean acidification kind of at large. And then each one has um, highlights a regional a regionally specific process that exacerbates ocean acidification and then regionally specific um, solutions that people can adopt. And the five regions that I have made these for are Alaska, Southern California, the Florida Keys, the Mid-Atlantic, and the New England regions. And so I'll walk you through each of them. I wanted to put these up side by side, um, not to overwhelm you because there's a lot going on, but just to kind of highlight that um, the, to highlight the similarities and differences in design and content. So you can see the animals are obviously different, um, indicating different ecosystems and the coloration is a little different. But on the left hand side of each infographic, I talk about ocean acidification at large. On the right is kind of the regionally specific issue. And at the bottom, there are solutions. Um, and these have evolved through time. As you'll notice, I go through them in order of which I made them. Um, and I also wanted to mention that they're, with the exception of Florida Keys, these are not finalized. They're almost there. Um, they should be done around sometime in October. Um, and we can let you know when they're done if you are interested in looking at a copy or using a copy or whatever the case may be. Okay, so this is um, the infographic, the first one that I made for uh, the Florida region or Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. Um, this one actually is uh, on the Florida Keys website. I believe it's on the NOAA Ocean Acidification Program website and potentially the Coral Program website. Um, but I'll walk you through this one probably in the most detail since it's the first one and I'll talk about how it's laid out. So I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but up in the top left, um, I have ocean acidification highlighted and that describes what ocean acidification is and kind of how it works. Um, here I have a smokestack icon, which I don't necessarily think is representative of Florida. Um, but again, this was the first one that I made. And it just shows that it's emitting carbon dioxide in these little bubbles. Um, I wanted to represent carbon dioxide as a physical thing on these infographics so people can kind of visualize what's happening. Because I know for me, I'm very much a visual learner and I think a lot of other people are too, just to help the process of understanding. Um, and then we have our friendly, Simplify a chemical equation showing that carbon dioxide plus water in equals increased acidity. Down here, I talk about how um, when the ocean absorbs CO2, uh, it kind of robs corals and other calcifying organisms of their building blocks, making them weaker and smaller over time. And then over here on the right, um, the issue that I highlighted in Florida is coastal acidification, and that's when nutrients um, from the water and land enter the water and they carry a lot of fertilizer from homes uh, with them. And so the fertilizers often contain a lot of nitrogen and phosphorus, and when that enters the ocean, um, it feeds phytoplankton, which then produce reproduce like crazy um, to the point where sometimes there are the Phytoplankton is so dense, it creates kind of this green carpet in the ocean almost. And so it blocks sunlight from penetrating the water um, and animals like corals need sunlight in order to persist. And then once these phytoplankton die, they sink to the bottom where they are decomposed, um, triggering more chemical reactions and depleting oxygen. So a lot of animals basically suffocate. 
Uh, and then at the bottom, we have what we can do to help in this region. So cutting back on watering your lawn um, or choosing drought intolerant landscaping can help reduce um, runoff into the ocean. Also reducing your use of fertilizers, especially those with nitrogen or phosphorus, because those are the limiting, uh, limiting reagents for these phytoplankton blooms in a lot of cases. Uh, eating plant-rich diet and buying local. And then when possible, reducing your energy use or switching to more energy efficient appliances. So acidification in Alaska, this is the second one that I did. Um, you'll notice that it is seems a little bit more upgraded, um, but the general layout is the same. Again, on the left, we have ocean acidification at large. Um, in the center here, I, I highlight that cold water holds more gas, which can lead to more acidification and makes Alaska a little bit more vulnerable to seeing the impacts of it. Uh, on the right hand, I have freshwater influence, which is um, caused by a glacial melt, which is a, a natural phenomenon. However, glaciers are melting more and more typically. Um, and so the problem with that is the freshwater enters the ocean and freshwater has uh, a, it's low in alkalinity, meaning it the freshwater is unable to withstand changes in pH. Um, and the ocean typically has a really good um, ability to do that. So essentially what's happening is the freshwater is diluting the seawater, making it more susceptible to chemical changes and ocean acidification. Um, and then at the bottom, which stays consistent through um, the next three infographics is it talks about um, how how um, ocean acidification kind of alters um, or changes the ability of animals to build their exos exoskeletons and shells and what scientists are doing in order to understand what's happening and then implement management. And the <clears throat> solutions in Alaska, again, are eating and buying local. I think I put this on all five um, infographics, reducing energy and choosing energy efficient appliances. Um, I was able to make a note of supporting local pop politicians that are in favor of the environment on this infographic because I was working with folks that don't, um, are not employed by NOAA. Uh, I couldn't do that in all the rest of them, but that's why this is here. And then of course, staying informed and taking care of your um, local environment. And I'll try to go a little quickly because we're running out of time and I want people to make sure they can ask questions if they need to. Um, next, we move on to the mid-Atlantic, and you'll see that this is not done. There is no graphic here on the right-hand side. Um, but again, on the left, we talk about ocean acidification at large. The center, I highlight that in the mid-Atlantic, um, they have these really cool, well, literally co cold pools that move south um, along the coastline uh, in the springtime. And these uh, deep cold waters have a lot of nutrients that feed phytoplankton, which then in turn feeds things that eat phytoplankton and up the food web. Um, the problem is, is the cold pools have become smaller and smaller over the last decade and these cold pools are important not only to feed the ecosystem but because they also represent kind of the southernmost boundary of a lot of really important fisheries like uh, this Atlantic sea scallop and the yellowtail flounder. So those are not as available in the lower uh, latitudes as they weren't once were. And in the mid-Atlantic, they experience eutrophication, which is where runoff that contains a lot of nutrients enter the water. And then kind of this the same phenomenon of uh, these phytoplankton blooms happen. Um, and I guess I haven't really been highlighting the marine life in these infographics, which I apologize for, but they are all regionally specific. Um, here we have the blue crab. We have um, yellow tail, tail flounder turtles, other types of fish, and then oysters, because we know oysters are very important in this region. Um, this is Chrysostria virginica. I know a lot of, about oysters because I did my master's in oysters, um, and seagrass. And then regional solutions down here, again, eating and buying local food, reducing energy use, reducing fertilizer, because this region is susceptible to eutrophication, and then taking care of your local marine environment. New England, uh, kind of similar to the Mid-Atlantic. It is north, north of that and colder. Um, but here I highlight that precipitation is changing in the New England region. So it's increasing 
Uh, and similar to the Alaska region, um, it's, it's an increased freshwater input to the water, right? So it's, if you recall, it is diluting seawater and making it more susceptible to changes in chemistry and ocean acidification. And New England also suffers from eutrophication, um, but that's triggered a lot by the increased rainfall on homes. And here we have um, the Atlantic salmon, scallops, clams, thornback skates, um, and other types of fish. So again, we want to eat and buy local food, reduce energy, and then here I highlight reducing runoff from your lawn. Um, you can use rain bar barrels, rain chains, all sorts of things, but trying to capture the rain that's instead of letting it all run off of your yard, you can catch it and use it for other things. And finally, acidification in Southern California. Um, this is the one that I did last, it's not totally done. Um, here I highlight that along our coast in California, we have a lot of upwelling, which is when through oceanographic processes, really deep nutrient rich cold water comes up and kind of fertilizes our coastline, um, which is really great, except for it's happening more and more. And this deeper water has a, a higher acidity. So it's kind of exacerbating ocean acidification along California's coastline. Um, and something really unique about California is we have a lot of kelp and we call kelp forest, kelp forest blue carbon ecosystems. Um, and this is because kelp is able to sequester carbon. So as it grows, it pulls carbon and kind of builds it into its um, blades and stipes. And so as they grow, pieces of kelp will break off the mother plant and float away and then they sink. And when they sink, they take all the carbon inside of them to the bottom of the ocean, which it's been essentially stored there for potentially millions of years. So it's, it's, it's sequestering carbon and taking carbon out of, out of our coastal systems where it's a problem and taking it into the deep, deep ocean. So kelp is really important for other reasons than that, but we, that's something really unique we have along California's coast. Um, and then we have our, our white sharks, our rockfish, urchins, garibaldi, sheephead, lobster, sea lions, um, and a whole lot more. But again, I highlight eating local produce and seafood, um, using alternative energy here in California, we get a lot of sunlight. So if you can, if you have the means to get solar panels, that's an option. Um, Community-based transportation with bike shares, um, buses when possible, walking, et cetera, and then supporting marine protected areas and blue carbon restoration initiatives. And here I have a gray whale because we have our sweet gray whales migrate through here in the springtime. Um, so those are my five infographics. Really quickly, I'll walk you through kind of my process of doing this so we can have hopefully like 10 minutes for questions. Um, so the first thing that I did when I started this process is I spoke with a lot of people um, in each region. And these people that I spoke with include um, researchers and scientists in some cases. More often than not, it was people that are active and involved in ocean acidification education. And these people especially are such good resources because they know the people, they know the area, they know how to speak to people, and they're, they want to promote more um, education. So these people, if any of you are on this call, thank you so much. You were very helpful. Um, so yeah, to help get me started and get me acquainted to the area. And we did this over Zoom before the pandemic, believe it or not. Um, and we also spoke on the phone, emailed, et cetera. And I wanted to say also that each one of these little points that I'm gonna hit, it's not a one and done process. It's very iterative. And I had multiple phone calls with people more in more cases than not, or multiple Zoom calls or multiple regular phone calls. Um, so it is an active and open communication um, in this regard. <clears throat> so after I was acquainted with the system a little bit by the people that know it best, I did a lot of my own research on the region. Um, and I did a lot of work on finding existing infographics or just kind of graphic design of the issues at hand. And this was really important too because after speaking with people that know the system, they are able to send me resources or helpful things that I can look at myself. But really in order, as many of you probably know, in order to teach something or talk about something, you really have to understand it yourself. 
Um, and this was easier for some regions than other. California probably was the easiest one for me, A, because I did it last, so my infographic design was pretty established at that point, and B, I've lived in Southern California my whole life. I've dove out here many times. I snorkel, I stand up paddle. I know what's out there, um, so it was easy for me to kind of at least find the different organisms I wanted to put in there and kind of understand the processes happening. Similar with Florida, I don't work in Florida specifically, but I work in coral ecosystems and acidification has kind of the same problems across um, coral reefs all over the world. Whereas the Northeastern region, so New England and Mid-Atlantic and then also Alaska, I'm a lot less familiar with those regions. So I had to do a lot more groundwork and finding um, good points to put in the infographics and understanding it enough to write about it. Um, and again, thanks to those people that helped me do that because without you, this would have taken a lot longer than it did. Um, the second, the infographic. So when I first did this, the Florida Keys infographic took me the longest because I had to start from scratch, which was great. Um, I did a lot of drawing by hand, kind of what I envisioned these to look like. Um, and like I mentioned, I did some research on existing infographics for climate change and ocean, ocean acidification. And honestly, relatively speaking, there is not a lot out there, um, which made me happy that I was doing this. Um, so my infographics will be out there for people to learn from and use. Um, but yeah, just a heads up, there's really not a lot out there. Um, and then I decided I wanted to do this in InDesign um, because on my old laptop, I have an older version of it on there and I really wanted to learn how to do it. So that I watched a lot of YouTube videos, did a lot of trial and error, um, but I also wanted to point out, you could totally make these in PowerPoint. Um, some of you may notice that I certainly am not a graphic designer. Uh, if there are any on this call, I have no doubt you could make a much more beautiful infographic than I can. Um, but this is a skill that I kind of wanted to gain. So I decided to teach myself how to use it. But again, I love PowerPoint. I do everything in PowerPoint otherwise, and you could totally make an incredible infographic in PowerPoint. You don't need a fancy Adobe suite to do so. Um, after I kind of figured out the lay of the land for my infographic, I wrote the text that I used. Um, so I had kind of, okay, in the top left, I'm gonna say this, and the center fold will be this, and then on the right, um, this is gonna be the issue that I highlight. So I wrote that out, um, and then I sent it to Jen and Laura, who I work with all the time, and then the folks in the region I was working in specifically at the time. And again, this is an extremely iterative process, um, and it takes a while, right? People are busy, people go into the field, people go on vacation, um, and people are just busy. So it, it this whole process does take quite a bit of time, but it's, again, collaborative and it's rewarding to work with people, I thought. So I do everything in Google Drive because it's just easier to share um, and I'd get feedback. And there is quite a bit of text in these infographics. However, it the words that are used in there were selected in a very conscientious way. Um, there's a lot more information out there that we would love to include in these infographics, but it is, it's really a skill and it's hard, as I'm sure a lot of you know, to use concise language to get a point across in as few words as you possibly can. So feedback is really, really helpful. Um, and then this is probably my favorite part, um, searching for icons. So there are plenty of free icons and clip art and graphics out there that you can use. Um, the Noun Project is a really good one, although there's tons of others. Um, so I did a lot of scouring the internet for this, for the infographics. Um, something that I learned while I was doing my master's, but I really did a lot of through this process was, let's say you need a picture of a whale or you want to use a whale and you find this one and you really like it. Except for it has this yellow background. Um, in PowerPoint, you're able to uh, copy and paste this into a slide and then there's under format picture, you can remove the background and soon enough you'll have a whale that looks like this and the background's transparent so you can overlay it on top of anything and there's not going to be a square around it. You can also change the color of things in PowerPoint. It doesn't work quite as well as Photoshop, um, which is probably obvious, but you, I just wanted to hit home that you don't need fancy programs in order to do these infographics. You could totally do the whole thing in PowerPoint. Um, 
and yeah, you put it all together. Um, and again, it's not just, okay, I checked off all these things and now I'm going to put the infographic together and now it's done. Um, oftentimes I ended up having to rewrite things or rearrange things or switch out icons. Um, and it's not, it's not a simple process, but it, it's a good one. It's good. And I've met a lot of people working, um, making these infographics and I really am thankful that I was able to do that. Um, and then one other thing that <laughs> this was difficult for me, especially in a way, because I have InDesign on my old laptop, but I use my new laptop, obviously, for other things. And so there is a lot of me in my new laptop is a lot faster. And so I did a lot of searching on Google for icons, downloading them, removing backgrounds, saving them in a folder, putting them on Google Drive, going on my old computer, downloading them <laughs> and putting them in a folder and then putting them into my infographic. And it was just there are far simpler ways to do this as well, is another point that I would like to make. But I, I really, I can't stress this enough. Anyone can do this. Um, I hope that you were able to pick up some tricks from me today. Um, and yeah, I, that's all I have for you. So thank you so much for your time and tuning in today. Um, if you have questions, I believe, yeah, we have some time for that. And then this is where you can find me elsewhere. So thank you. Thanks, Erin. Um, great job. And we have a lot of questions and we have some comments uh, coming in as well. And um, I, you know, this community, there's a wealth of knowledge in this ocean acidification science and education community. And there are people who are making a few suggestions on the draft infographics that, that you have. And, you know, we certainly welcome that input. So you can email um, the NOAA email that we'll show you at the end of this and we're also um, we're also capturing all the questions in the question box so we can refer to those so if you have ideas or suggestions um, you know while we're finalizing these we certainly welcome those um, uh, so we've got a lot of great Great comments and questions. Just a couple um, comments. Um, there's someone here from Alaska who said we have a lot of solar panels when there um, is 24 hours of daylight in the summer. So that's a oh. really awesome thing to know. <laughs> and um, I didn't know that. Thank you for reminding me. And and there's um, you know lots of uh, suggested solutions uh, like um, having a plant-based diet and wasting less food. Um, there's people from, from uh, Hawaii and the Pacific who are interested in an infographic for that area, um, which is really cool. Um, there's one question here uh, about, um, and, and I struggle with this too, and, and maybe I'm going to ask you, but as I ask you, I'm going to ask the audience as well if they have some ideas to put this in the question box, is um, finding that most students, younger students, have no idea what osteoporosis is. Is there a metaphor that might work better for student audiences? So, Erin, I don't know if you have ideas for that or if there's other members of our audience who have some ideas for what metaphors might work well um, for, for our younger audience. That would be, that would be great to hear I, that. I have one that pops into my mind. In that handout, there are a whole bunch. Um, I. I threw this one in the Florida Keys infographic, but I, in my haste, I forgot to mention it. Um, and it's equating the ocean to kind of the heart in a human body, where the heart regulates blood pressure and kind of how your body functions in a day-to-day -day basis. The ocean also regulates our climate and temperature and precipitation. And overall, it kind of regulates how the earth functions in a way and I'm kind of butchering the actual metaphor um, but that is a really good one that I also really like and that is also in the handout as well as others I don't know Laura if you have another good one off the top of your head I was just gonna scroll down and see if uh, we had some things from our from our audience yeah heart somebody says heart and lungs is a metaphor um, comparing OA to drinking soda and how that can affect your teeth um, works with different age yeah. groups. So, um, yeah, we're getting some other ideas um, kind of rolling in here, and it seems like tooth decay is one that keeps that keeps coming in. Um, and then, I heard that. Yeah, another another uh, question. Um, 
people are asking about the graphics and the icons and stuff like that. And um, maybe we can look into and talk to you further after this, um, if those could be available for other people who want to make their own infographics. Um, that's something that's definitely of interest there um, in our audience. Okay. So, um, yeah, I've got them all saved, so that should be easy enough to do. Yeah, and lots of um, lots of questions about um, how we're going to share and and promote these materials. And again, we will put them on the NOAA Ocean Acidification website as soon as they're completed. Uh, I meant to say that. I don't know if I actually did, so I apologize if I did not say that. Yeah, um, and then there's a question: Would the poster for Southern California? be the best to model um, for the Pacific Northwest Oceans since kelp and upwelling are similar? Yeah, I, I think um, it could be easy enough to tweak and then have more um, Pacific Northwest species switched out. But again, I don't know as much about that region specifically, but it seems that it could be used for that. And I mean, I can talk to you after or Laura or something about even just switching the title and just say the you know Pacific West Coast if it's that trans transferable um, that's really easy to do and I think that's great that you want to use it yeah yeah and we can we can talk to some of our Pacific Northwest colleagues about that um, and there's mm -hmm. a specific question about the Alaska infographic in terms of mm -hmm. what region of Alaska is it set for um, the Arctic, the Southeast, the Aleutians? That is a really great question and it's not set to any specific region in Alaska and I do realize Alaska is huge. I don't know what percent of the continental U.S. size it is but it's I know it's giant. Um, we just did this to incorporate all of Alaska kind of at large and it probably could be beneficial to make more specific re regions of Alaska into their own infographics. Um, yeah, that's a good point. It's not it's not a specific region of Alaska at all. And I do realize there are probably major differences between all of them. Great. Uh, and um, gosh, we're running short on time. I bet we could continue to answer um, and have conversations about all of this. Um, but again, a really great uh, presentation and we'll definitely try to get to the rest of your questions in a follow-up email if we didn't get to your question um, today. And Jen, have you, um, let's see, have you changed the presenter back to me yet? I'm, if you can do that, if you haven't already, that would be fantastic. Let's see. All right. Um, so thank you all for um, attending our webinar today. And we welcome your feedback and suggestions um, for future topics for the webinar series. Uh, you can submit input by replying to the follow-up email that you'll get from us or by contacting us at the emails listed on the screen. Um, you'll also have opportunity to provide feedback with a survey that will appear at the end of today's webinar. We'd greatly appreciate it if you could take a few moments to complete that, as the feedback is what allows us to continue hosting the series and inform NOAA of its impact. And we'll share a recording of the webinar via Google Drive uh, and on the OAP YouTube channel. Um, and uh, the next webinar, that is something that we are definitely open to your ideas and suggestions. Uh, we don't have that lined up yet, but look for it later this fall and we'll announce it on the source website. And also something very exciting uh, that we want to share with you is um, Ocean Acidification Week, which is next week. Um, and this is a great way to immerse yourself in ocean acidification science and initiatives from around the world. It's a three-day virtual event. Um, and you can learn more and pre-register at the Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network website um, at the link that's shown here. Um, so that's a pretty uh, exciting opportunity. I hope some of you will participate in that. Um, and thanks again for everyone uh, for joining us today. And thank you, especially Aaron, for your wonderful presentation. Um, we have lots of great feedback on it here. And so awesome. this is the, yeah. Uh, so this is the end of today's session and we look forward to seeing you all soon.